Yeah, so I've just finished reading Ready Player One by Ernest Cline, and I saw the movie. To be honest, the book was much better. Wait a minute, you're reading books now? Well, all this blah 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 from you about books, I figured I might as well start reading. Fair enough. Why did you think the book was better? I don't know, it just was. It was just better. Today we're going to deconstruct the whole the book was better than the movie thing. Comparing a book to a movie is like comparing Mars to Jupiter because they're different planets. Well, because they're different forms of art. If you look at it on the surface, there are already tons of differences between each one of them. But I'll get to that in a bit. There is a reason the comparison is made. They're conceptually telling the same story, using the same characters and the same names. In our heads, it's the same brand. And the same story can be told in different forms of art through different types of media. Not only books and movies, but games, comics, TV series, radio, animation, and even puppet shows. That's right, you could have a Ready Player One puppet show. Hi, I'm Parzival. Hi, I'm H. But let's focus on movie adaptations. First of all, making a movie consists of a number of people, such as script writers, producers, directors, the camera crew, actors, makeup artists, just to name a few. And they all have to come together to make the story happen. Well, I know that now because I've got to sit through the damn credits to see the post credit scenes in Marvel movies. And the number of people working on a book is much smaller. There's the writer, who will often work with an agent and an editor at a publishing company. In an adaptation, the movie's trying to adhere to the structures and methods of storytelling, originally made for a completely different medium. Creating a movie adaptation is the process of translating a book into a movie. And if you've ever tried to translate anything, you'll know that it's impossible to translate something with 100% accuracy. The average length of a movie is about two hours, and that's the same for everyone who's watching. But get any good book and you're looking to spend at least four hours on it, if not days or even weeks. That varies on your reading speed and the time you have to read without being interrupted by anyone. Hey! Hey! Hey, 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 what? Oh, nothing, I just wanted to know how you were doing. In a book, the level of intimacy with the story and the characters ultimately rises simply based on the time you spend reading that book. Because you spend more time generating emotions for each character during that process of reading. Intimacy is definitely a key point here because how you shape that character in your head depends a lot on your imagination. And yes, an author can be extremely descriptive about a character, but constructing that image is up to you. And in that sense, you incorporate that character in your head. I'm listening. In a movie, it depends a lot on how an actor portrays a character. And sometimes that intimacy not only comes with the actor's performance, but also your familiarity with previous roles you've seen that actor play. Yeah, I used to have this image of Frodo in my head. I kind of identified myself with him. Now he just looks like Elijah Wood. And the movie adaptation can be epic simply because of a performance of one actor, like Heath Ledger's Joker or Marlon Brando's Don Corleone. Emotion is another key point here, because essentially the job of any art form is to make you feel something. And there's a difference between something being good when you look at it as a form of art, and something that makes you feel good or makes you feel a range of emotions. What? That doesn't make any sense whatsoever. Maybe it was set in your own town. Maybe DiCaprio's in it, or maybe it was directed by Spielberg. In that sense, you could be biased because you have an attachment to one of these elements used in the film. Ready Player One was a book that made me feel good, mostly because of all the nostalgic references. The movie itself has major discrepancies from the book. In a way, the movie did an okay job at representing those references in the movie. The Martian by Andy Weir is overall a good book, especially for someone who likes science. And Matt Damon did a decent job at representing Mark Watney's humour and all the other technicalities in the book. Get Harper Lee's To Kill a Mockingbird and both book 
and movie are simply phenomenal. So from a critical perspective, you can consider a book good, not only because of the story, but also because of the writing style. The same way you can appreciate a movie for not only how it makes you feel, but for its cinematography and how certain elements are represented in it. Being able to critically analyze each element of a book or a movie and understanding the director's or the writer's choices can bring you a lot more enjoyment when consuming that work of art. Truth is, we're in constant search for goosebumps when watching a movie or reading a book. Acquiring more taste for each form of art can bring you more pleasure. Each medium has its own tools and methods to work with. Think about a horror movie that has the ability to include jump scares, which is a pretty bad trend in horror films these days. I'm only joking, it's just me. Dude, what are you doing? In comics, one of my favorite artists is Junji Ito, who cleverly uses his detailed and sickening art along with the page turn. Here's an example. In a book, horrors mainly rely on the capability of the author to set the atmosphere and describe how a character's feeling during a scary moment. And trust me, when you're immersed in a book like this at 2am, it could be as freaky as hell. So movies and books have different tools at their disposal. My bespectacled version, who is blatantly me with glasses, is just a tool that I use to tell a story. What? You're telling me this now? Which I know sometimes can be confusing, but in a book, that confusion would never exist. Characters in books also have internal monologues that allow the reader to know what's going on inside their heads. If not, maybe the narrator might tell you what's on the character's mind. What does he mean, I'm only a tool for him to use? Who does he think he is? In films, having someone talk over the scenes just doesn't feel right and can sometimes come off as annoying. So it comes down to the actor's ability to portray what the character's thinking and feeling. For example, Christopher Nolan's Dunkirk hardly has any dialogue. So the movie industry is always looking for ways to add to the experience of the film and make viewers feel more, like IMAX 3D and popcorn. If you aren't satisfied with the adaptation of your favourite book, you're probably not alone. It's not rare that authors themselves dislike the movie for their book. When authors sell their rights to a production company, they might not get much say in the outcome of the movie, and hardly get to make any decisions. Stephen King had complaints about Stanley Kubrick's The Shining, claiming that Kubrick couldn't grasp the sheer evil of the Overlook Hotel. Alan Moore, the author of Watchmen and V for Vendetta, disliked the adaptation so much that he asked for his name to be taken off the credits. He's taken it to such extreme that he doesn't even accept money from the adaptations. He argues that stories should be written exclusively for each medium, and I don't necessarily disagree with that. Most of my favourite movies aren't based on books, like Pulp Fiction, The Matrix and Interstellar. I also think that's why some of the best directors like Tarantino and Christopher Nolan tend to steer away from adaptations. On the other end of the spectrum, Mario Puzo assisted with both writing the screenplay and the production of The Godfather. And we all know how that went. It's the pinnacle of adaptations. It's considered by many one of the best movies of all time, and it won various awards and Oscars. Other great adaptations are Michael Crichton's Jurassic Park and Chuck Palahniuk's Fight Club. But some movies can be incredibly bad, like the Death Note Netflix adaptation or the Dragon Ball movie. Budget is also also a big deal when it comes to adaptations, and if not, it's the biggest deal. Simply because there's a high financial risk in making a movie, so a producer has to make that a priority. In a book, if the writer decides to set the story on Mars, it will cost the same as setting the story in a garden shed. But in a movie, one can cost millions in computer graphics and production, and the other one will cost 100 quid and a bus fare to Ikea. According to John Green, the author of The Fault in Our Stars, if a book sells 50,000 copies in a year, it's considered a success. But if a movie sells 50,000 tickets in its opening weekend, it's considered a
competitive failure and will probably lose a lot of money. Even selling 500,000 tickets will probably mean the movie sucked. So the director really has to cater for the audience's needs because it's not only the book community consuming that story now. So basically it's all about making money. Well, at least these days it feels like that. And knowing the story was successful in book form minimizes the financial risks. One book I'd recommend to understand the process of making a film is the Angry Filmmaker Survival Guide by Kelly Baker. It gives a true notion of the hard and painful process it is to make a film. From issues like actors not turning up or equipment breaking on the day of the shoot. So to conclude, whenever I watch a movie adaptation of a book, part of me wants to sum up all the emotions I get from the book and compare it to all the emotions I got from the movie. And part of me wants to be comprehensive about the decisions made in the movie and try to watch it from an impartial standpoint. I personally find it really hard to separate those two as different entities. Inevitably, one will interfere with our perception of the other almost merging into one thing. The most important part is to gain new perspectives on each medium by understanding the creative process behind each one. Not that certain adaptations can't be ultimately bad, but we should at least look for some positive points before criticizing. That goes for movies and anything we decide to judge or criticize in life. Lastly, we should learn to love each of the art forms for what they are. Well, I still think the book was better than the movie. Okay then, well, you don't even exist anyway. What do you mean I don't exist? I'm joking, okay? You exist. In my heart. As a character. But just like George R. R. Martin, I can erase you just like that. Uh, no you can't. Yes, I can. See ya. No! I hope you enjoyed this video. If you did, hit the like button and let me know your thoughts in the comment section. And subscribe if you haven't already. See you next video.